So before we delve into the realm of organic electronics, I'd like to begin with a question. What does technology mean to you? We've talked about this a lot today, and so I assume you think of your cell phones, your laptops, but technology is an umbrella term and also encompasses energy, from coal-fired power plants to nuclear energy. And so technology is a massive realm, and energy within that is a large field of study with more than 97% of scientists confirming human contribution to global warming, it's increasingly important that we develop renewable energy. So the future will, out of necessity, be a patchwork quilt of all sorts of technology, whether that's wind turbines, fuel cells, solar cells, hydropower, biomass, anything. And the United Kingdom, at the end of April, had its first full day, 24 hours, coal-free since the Industrial Revolution. So we're making strides, this is happening. And last month, 24.3% of the electricity generated here in the UK was powered by solar. So today I'd like to talk about solar energy specifically as something that will rise to the fore in tackling global warming. So solar energy is a massively underutilized resource. The small fraction of sunlight that reaches our Earth in a single day is enough energy to power human activities for an entire year. So clearly, we have a long way to go in utilizing this massive resource. So what is the technology today, and why is it limited? What's wrong with it? Why isn't it enough? And since it's not enough, what do we need to do in order to make it enough? What new technology do we need to develop so that we can approach this new world that lives sustainably? So today, I'm sure you recognize these solar cells. I saw many of them on the train ride up from London to Edinburgh. These are silicon-based solar cells, and so silicon is an inorganic element. So we're talking about inorganic chemistry. So silicon solar cells operate um, by arranging silicon atoms in a very crystalline lattice, which means you end up with bulky, rigid, heavy materials that really only have application in fields or on roofs. So right there, it's pretty limited. They're pretty obtrusive, you'll notice when they're in the vicinity. So they're used because they're extremely efficient. At this point in time, they're roughly 26% efficient. That's, that's great. But we need something more versatile so they can be everywhere and we can really take full advantage of solar energy. This is where we delve into the realm of organic solar cells. As opposed to silicon-based inorganic solar cells, we now talk about carbon-based materials, which do not exist in that rigid lattice in the same way silicon does. Carbon is a flexible material, like a sheet of paper, and light, like a sheet of paper. <laughs> so light, in fact, that some solar cells can even fit on top of a soap bubble without popping it. They're also extremely easy to fabricate. While silicon requires a really high purity atom, these photovoltaics can be printed like a piece of paper, ink onto paper, and distributed around the world inexpensively and installed inexpensively. So what's wrong? Why don't we have these everywhere? Right now they're not as efficient, only about 11% efficient as opposed to 26% efficient. But this is due to a lack of understanding. It's a very new technology. And so how do we improve this understanding? A novel sort of property of organic photovoltaics is their ability to be changed chemically. If you have a material A that takes sunlight and turns it into energy at a certain efficiency, and you marry it with material B, now you have A and B together, and it suddenly does that job much more efficiently, you have this new material. But when you combine infinite different components, suddenly your palette is massive, and it takes a long time to figure out the best combination to get the most energy out of the sun. So this is organic solar cells. How does it work? Let's go back to the atom. This year at Imperial College London, I've been studying fuel cells and solar cells, and I've become fascinated with charge transport. And I would like to share this fascination with you so that you might begin to understand what solar energy even really is. We hear about it all the time, but what's happening on the molecular level? So here's our atom. We have our nucleus, which is a positively charged mass. And around that nucleus, we have electrons traversing in a circle an orbital. So when we take sunlight and we irradiate this atom with sunlight, a wave packet or quanta or photon of light imparts its energy to the electron. And the electron then, with this new energy, jumps into the next highest orbital. And since it is negatively charged, the nucleus is positively charged, 
Moving further away causes tension on the system and requires that extra energy in order to even happen. So now we have an excited state. So let's come back here and lay out some terms. So in this furthermost orbital, far away from the nucleus where our electron lies, that we call the highest occupied orbital. And the one just beyond it without an electron is the lowest unoccupied orbital. And the difference between this lowest unoccupied and this highest occupied energy band is called a band gap. And so some molecules have very large band gaps, and some molecules have very small band gaps. So if we zoom in, just looking at the band gap, we see the electron in its relaxed position a certain distance from the nucleus, and we see its potential to jump to an excited state. So now again, we shine light onto our system, and that photon hits the system, gives the electron enough energy to jump into its excited state. But now where it was is a hole, a vacancy, where it once belonged. And this acts as a negative space, and it is concrete, just like that electron. And so we have an electron and a hole, and both are particles, which is kind of hard to imagine. So now if we take our system, and we imagine our electron and hole, they are sort of talking to each other. They're bound, they're, they're partners. And so they're coulombically bound together. And this state of electron hole pair is called an exciton. So now if we have our system of organic molecules and we apply a power source, a voltage bias, and tip the bands, we have our system now in a dynamic state. We have our heavy electron and this hole in space that's light like a bubble, and they begin to move. The electron starts to roll down and the hole begins to float up. And ultimately, this, this coulombic bond will be broken, and they'll run free. And this movement of electrons and holes is electricity. And that's how a solar cell works. You have sunlight giving enough energy to an electron to jump into an excited state. You break the exciton, and that movement of charge is electricity. Now, what happens if we switch the voltage bias, if we power it the other way? And if we were to inject electrons and inject holes from an external source, once again, the electrons would roll down, the holes would float up, they would meet in the middle, become coulombically bound, they would see each other, and sort of be entangled in each other's gravity. And there you have an exciton, once again. And if the gravity is strong enough, the electron will fall back down into its hole, into its relaxed state. And in doing so, it loses energy. And that energy is given off as a photon, once again. And so this photon has an equal amount of energy as the energy lost by the electron. And so this emission of light is an LED. And so this is how an organic LED works, the same principle, the same principle that's powering the phones in your hand by Samsung with the curved screens. They're curved because they're carbon-based and flexible, as opposed to the rigid rectangular interfaces of the iPhone, for example. And so it introduces a host of new possible technologies. So but how exactly does that work? How, how do you get these multifaceted colors? So we take, for example, molecule A, which has a small band gap. The electron has a shorter distance to fall, which means less energy. So you get a low energy wavelength emitted, which is red light. And now you have a big band gap. It loses a lot of energy in falling. And you get blue light. And now we have our OLED TVs which, as some of you have seen, are curved because it's a flexible substance. OK, back to solar cells real quick. So same principle, right? We have our exciton. Now, just as LEDs give off light of a certain frequency, a certain color, so can solar cells absorb light of different frequencies. We can tune the band gap so that solar cells will only absorb ultraviolet light or only absorb infrared light but won't absorb anything in the visible realm of the spectrum, which means visible light goes straight through. And that leaves us with transparent solar cells. This means that every window in every building, every dashboard of every car, every screen on every phone, every screen on every computer is a solar cell. And now we have the marriage of our traditional idea of technology and energy. And the only thing that's missing is our incomplete understanding, which we can fix with fundamental research into this technology to make it ubiquitous, something you don't even notice is a part of your life. And so then at the end of the day, you're left asking, what does chemistry mean to you?
Thank you.